doctors have long had medical legal liabilities. They could be sued if they left instruments or swabs inside people after operations, for example. The comrades have been active in America since the days of Lenin. Five or six decades ago, they started promoting litigation for errors of judgment as well as errors of practice. Since doctors have far from perfect knowledge, this was far below the belt. The doctor-patient relationship is based on mutual trust. Not only must the patient trust the doctor, the doctor must trust the patient. Doctors became unable to trust their patients. To safeguard their livelihoods, they had to put medical legal security above the welfare of patients. Increasingly, patients were referred for expensive confirmatory investigations so that in the event of litigation, the doctor could say he had substantiated his judgment. But when a doctor suggests a need for further investigation, the hearts of patients, who are already in a hypersensitive state, leap into their mouths. They fear there is something seriously wrong. Instead of immediate reassurance, they have an anxious and demoralizing wait, often lasting weeks, to get the results. Patients feel worse rather than better. It was this elementary clinical psychology that was subversively exploited in America and later the rest of the world with ever more expensive consequences. The effect was not only demoralizing but also sometimes lethal. In my book I describe a case in Canada in 1964 where a patient asked me outright whether I thought she had heart disease and promptly had a heart attack when I told her the truth. I stabilized her before moving her to hospital where she made a complete recovery. But when I told him, my supervisor was livid. To avoid any medical legal comeback, I should have bundled her into an ambulance where she would certainly have died. The upshot of such circumstances was the development of intensive care. Medical legal pressures then ensured that such units were used for the prevention of death rather than the saving of life. The effect was to produce ever more helpless and expensively dependent cripples. The elderly were similarly treated. Fearful of being sued by relations if they died, patients got treated with antibiotics for what should have been their last illness. They then survived to become geriatric vegetables, again making massive demands for care and depriving families of their inheritance. Healthy people, fearful this might happen to them, began vainly writing living wills. Afraid of being sued for the untoward consequences of infection, antibiotics were administered even for trivial infections. This speeded the process of antibiotic resistance, creating MRSA, C. diff, and a host of other untreatable bacteria that have yet to emerge. A recent spell in hospital myself led me to suspect that all medication is now prescribed for medical legal rather than clinical reasons. The promotion of litigation has been a clinical and social disaster. It has destroyed trust and massively increased costs. The expenditure on medical care in America is legendary. It is reported that the National Health Service now costs £100 billion a year. But lawyers are not qualified in medicine. Moreover, no matter how mighty the laws of the land, the laws of nature are mightier, and it is the laws of nature that determine the course of illness. By allowing themselves to be bewitched by the comrades, it is lawyers, not doctors, who have been professionally negligent. If the people want affordable health care, they'll have to sack their lawyers. The elimination of subversive medical legal expense would massively reduce the demoralizing cost of health care. For more detail, download my book, More Than a Puff of Smoke. The link is in the sidebar.